welcome to the uh, Future of Burbank panel event. I'm Michael Cusimano, and I will be your moderator this morning. In addition to my role as managing director of the Cusimano Real Estate Group, I am the, the chairman of the board of the Providence St. Joseph's Foundation and a member of its real estate committee. Uh, the, we formed the real estate committee because we firmly believe that what is good for St. Joe's is good for the real estate community. And because we have learned that we can do very well by doing good. In fact, my family employed one of the tools that we will talk about briefly at the end of this program to make a gift to the hospital and the tax benefits were well beyond anything we could have gotten in the straight sale. And importantly, brokers get the same commissions when utilizing these tools. As you will see on your screen, St. Joe's is in the midst of a capital campaign to build a critically needed new emergency services and urgent care facility that will double the capacity of the current ER and triple the size with state-of-the-art technology and infrastructure. This project is a major value add to everyone in the development community and all of the projects that we are going to look at today will be beneficiaries of this new facility. Now we are fortunate to have with us today four of the most prominent forces in the local real estate industry who will share with us some of their insights on what the future of the Burbank real estate market holds and what the overall economy may look like in the coming years. We have with us today Jeff Worth, president of the Worth Real Estate Group. We have Simone McFarland, uh, assistant uh, community development director for housing and economic development. We have Charlie Tortolot, uh, founder and chairman of Laterra Development LLC. Timur Tessimer, chief executive officer of Overton Moore Properties, uh, who's developing the AVM project here in Burbank. So let's jump right into uh, our webinar and we'll start with Jeff Worth. Jeff, thanks for being with us today. Hey, Michael. It's been, it's been said that the Warner Brothers Second Century deal is the most difficult and unique real estate deal in the history of Burbank. Can you describe some of the interesting aspects of that purchase, sale, and leaseback transaction that we may not be aware of? Sure. Um, well, to start, the transaction took eight years from the beginning until we got all the documents completed. Uh, it involved a lot of different components. The first is an 810,000 square foot office lease that Warner Brothers signed with us on our property, which is the uh, Burbank Studios, formerly the NBC studio lot in Burbank. In addition, um, Upon completion of those buildings, they're going to purchase the balance of the lot. So we'll retain the office buildings, but they're going to purchase the production space on that studio lot. And we're going to purchase their ranch lot, the 30 acre ranch lot that they also currently own in Burbank. And finally, um, we've already purchased three office buildings from them that are across from the main lot, totaling about 300,000 square feet. So there's a lot of moving parts. In addition to all of the um, the transaction complications that go on with something of that size. In the midst of all the negotiations, AT&T came in to purchase Time Warner and the government sued to stop that transaction. So that obviously uh, put some delays in, in, in our discussions. Uh, the government lost the case and decided to appeal and then lost that appeal. So that's in part what took the uh, extended uh, time here. So Jeff, one of the things that, um, that, you, that you mentioned was the Warner Brothers Ranch property. That's such an amazing property. Um, do you want to talk about that and maybe what your plans are for that as well? Or, or you want to maybe spend some more time on talking about the actual Second Century building? Yeah, just so we can finish on Second Century. Um, I think there's some images up. Uh, we started construction about August. So now we're at the bottom of the four level parking garage. The buildings are 810,000 feet. The parking garage is over a million feet. So the entire project is, is closer to 2 million square feet of development. Um, as you mentioned, as, as part of this, when these buildings are finished, we'll do a 1031 and sell the portion of the lot that these buildings don't exist on and purchase 
their ranch lot, which is the uh, 30 acre lot um, over near Hollywood Way. You know, our plans for that, it's, it's early that we don't purchase that until 2023. Um, it is fully entitled. It's entitled very similar, uh, with the same type of improvements that this project had, office and production space. So based on where the world is today and the demand for production, um, as the streaming wars have begun, um, and, and LA is obviously a very big beneficiary of that and a big part of um, the production demand increase, uh, it's likely that project will, will be developed further as a studio lot, um, at just as we've done with this one here. Thanks, Jeff. That's really exciting. Uh, you know, as we look at the images of the Second Century Project, um, you know, this is going to have a, a complete transformational effect on, on real estate here in Burbank. Uh, so it's really an exciting project. Just briefly, uh, before we, we move on to Simone, uh, any, any thoughts on um, what the impact of uh, so much square footage coming on to the market in the city of Burbank? Uh, you now own the other Warner Brothers properties. Any any insights on uh, the impact on the uh, short-term leasing market here in Burbank? No, I mean this building's fully leased. It's so um, you know our current portfolio. I think the Burbank. It's there's various stats with various firms, but the the office market in, in Burbank is probably somewhere around six and a half million feet today until this eight hundred thousand feet comes online. Um, we own a, a good portion of that. Um, you know, almost three quarters of it, and we're basically full. So as part of this transaction, we'll, we will, um, we've inherited, we purchased already another 300,000 feet from Warner, which they lease until 23, but um, we really don't have a big supply chain going forward for office space in this market. Um, and I think there is gonna be continued demand um, from groups in, in this, in this city today and plus new groups coming in want to be near and, and, and doing business with them. So I'm not, um, we're very bullish on where this market will go in the long term and, um, you know, we're excited about it. Thanks, Jeff. Again, just an absolutely phenomenal project and uh, something we're all excited about and, and thanks for sharing it with us. Uh, we're going to move on now to Simone. Uh, Simone, we're going to talk a little bit about the city of Burbank. Um, so. Talk a little bit about what the city of Burbank is doing to address the jobs housing imbalance that exist. The city is job rich and housing poor, as you well know. We have 108,000 people and 154,000 jobs, which means that 128,000 people drive into Burbank each day, essentially doubling our population. So to help solve these problems, we do two things. One, we need to build housing to allow for more people to live and work in Burbank. And secondly, we need to increase the use of our mass transit systems so that those who don't wanna live here can come into work using their cars. So between 2010, 2016, the city built less than 300 houses, yet we grew by more than 17,000 jobs. Um, you know, so the problem's real, we have to own it. In 2017, the City Council approved the Burbank Affordable Housing Analysis and Strategy. And in January of last year, we went ahead and um, we set a goal to facilitate 12,000 units in 15 years along with the transportation corridors. So the goal is to help the development of new housing that's affordable to all different segments while maintaining our community character. And we have a, what we call the housing puzzle. And the puzzle consists of a number of things, housing policies, code amendments, long range plans, implementing our homeless strategy and others. So some of the work that we've been doing is starting to pay off. If you wanna go back one slide, Teleria, your, your project you know so well, Mike. Um, it's an award winning project, it's gorgeous. It, we love having the Whole Foods incorporated underneath it. It's a really good example of how to enrich the concept of building livable, walkable neighborhoods. And then the next project we have a slide for is the Burbank uh, First Street Village project with 275 units. Mixed use will be a part of this and it, with uh, bottom row, floor retail. And then Latera, which Charlie's gonna talk about with 573 units of housing. 
And then lastly, the Monet, which is another slide, a density pro bonus project located at 615 Cedar that has 46 units. So we take all of those and we add in our ADUs and our ordinances for those. And we have about 1,500 units that are either built under construction or approved for the last three years, which was pretty amazing considering what we were doing before. So we still have some work to do, a lot of work to do. Uh, the puzzle, the housing puzzle includes density bonus and inclusionary, and we have to update the specific plans. And lastly, you know, we have to talk about transportation when we're talking about housing. So recently we added the pink line to the Burbank bus. And what that does is it runs from downtown into the, through the media district into Universal Studio City Station, where it links to the red line. And then we were just awarded, we weren't, but the California State Transportation Agency awarded $107 million to Metrolink, which we're gonna combine with major M funds. And that'll mean that we double track the, the rail. And basically we'll have 30 minute bi-directional service between Union Station and Santa Clarita going straight through Burbank, which will be awesome for us. So together with building the housing units and increasing the transportation options, we think we can provide uh, the quality of life that Burbank wants, uh, along with uh, adding more development. Wonderful, Simone. Um, just briefly before we move on, could you just give a, a quick uh, second on what the city is doing to uh, revitalize the economy uh, as a result of the COVID-19 situation? And, Oh, if there's any specific plans uh, for Burbank to aid in those recovery efforts. Sure, you know, COVID's been a, a huge blow to the world economy and Burbank's not immune. Uh, nationally, we have 80% of the businesses nationwide sought some type of financial funding. And in Burbank, that means 10,080. So our hotel occupancy in April was 76% deep down from the year prior. And the airport had 60% decrease in operations, that's takeoff and landings and 95% down in passengers. So we know uh, retail is still struggling. Today, actually, we have really good news. IKEA is opening and the Burbank Town Center uh, is opening. So grab your pocketbooks. We need that retail sales tax to come back in. Uh, and we just went to the city council to have an economic development recovery plan. And the plan really talks about um, what we're doing to help move things forward. We're working with our businesses. We've created webinars like very similar to this, focused on business issues. We have uh, forgivable loans that we're gonna start handing out a small amount of money, unfortunately. But we'll be giving some businesses, micro businesses and small businesses loans for $5,000 and $10,000. Also, we're working with our business improvement district to reallocate the marketing funds, particularly with our tourism group for day travelers and drive, drive travel. And then lastly, we're really looking at how do we change some of the things that we're doing, particularly looking at AUPs for restaurants downtown. And we're working with the restaurants to see how we incorporate outdoor dining a lot easier and reviewing the R1 and multifamily standards to provide efficiencies. Everything that we have, our roadmap is actually on our website. It's burbankca.gov and it's under the COVID page, uh, Burbank's Road to Recovery. Wonderful, Simone. Thank you so much for that insight. Uh, and in, as we were talking about housing and large, bringing large scale housing uh, to the city of Burbank. Uh, you know, we're so fortunate to have uh, Charlie from L Latera Development. Uh, Charlie and his team uh, just completed the entitlement of eight acres on Front Street. Uh, Charlie, you've got an amazing site, an amazing mixed use project. Uh, why don't you tell us about the project, how it came to be and what it means for Burbank? Yeah, yeah, Mike, thank you very much. I just want to say that I'm uh, honored and happy to be part of this uh, Future of Burbank webinar. It's just uh, an exciting time for Burbank and, and for La Terra to be a part of it. So the, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of the project and, and then take you through a little bit about how we, uh, how we got entitled with the city and then some, what some of our goals are, uh, were and are for the project. So. It's an eight acre, eight acre site, like you mentioned, and we spent uh, 
the better part of four years, really, getting it entitled. But well worth it. Well worth it. We we ended up with uh, something that I think is is going to be really good for the community. We ended up with uh, with 573 apartments, a little over 300 hotel rooms, and a transit plaza, uh, which ends up being a landscaped, large landscaped open space area uh, that connects uh, to both Burbank Boulevard and connects the project to Magnolia on the south end of the site. And, and the market's ready for this. And I think, um, you know, I think so may have mentioned this, the, the, the not much has been built in Burbank in the last uh, many years. And I think the only really class A project has been Talaria and hat tip to Mike and your firm for uh, bringing a, such a great, beautiful project to the market. Um, but, but as you know, we have a big job supply demand imbalance, right? So we've got Warner Brothers, we've got Disney, you know, only, you know, 40,000 households and over 150,000 jobs. So that's super important. You know, three and a half jobs uh, per household, which is one of the highest in the state of California. So, uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so right now we've got, um, um, whenever you can, yeah, thank you very much. So the, the project's gonna be highly amenitized and you can see that rooftop deck, it's beautiful, right? <laughs> and so we've, we've, and then in the lower left and lower right, you can see our connecting points. So the elevator and stair tower on the Magnolia Boulevard side and on the Burbank Boulevard side, we're gonna have a gallery link in connecting to Burbank Boulevard. And next slide, please. And so, uh, Let's see, there we go. So there's the public plaza. And, and then we're gonna have, uh, we're adding big wide bike lanes and connection down to the Metrolink station, which is just to the south of us, the bus station and Metrolink station. And then finally on the lower images, you can see some of the uh, images of the architectural images of the hotel and, and how that is intended to look in the, from landscape areas. So next slide, please. So uh, the, the important goals that we had were to be green, right? We wanted to make sure we were building a safe neighborhood and get to, uh, all the sustainability features built in, and we did. And so we're gonna be lead gold, and, and we ended up with uh, plenty of community benefits for the city and for the residents, right? So we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have uh, you know, contribution to school fees, and we're gonna have jobs, and then, uh, uh, plenty of community benefits that ended up being over $30 million in value, including affordable housing. Uh, next slide, please. So, so finally, you know, I think it, you know, what we wanted to say is we really engaged the community. We ended up having over 25 community meetings. We, and I uh, can't tell you how many meetings with the great city staff, but we had super good support all the way around by the time we were done. And this, uh, what, what we are going to see and what we are seeing is the result of all of that. And that was one of our goals. So that's, that's our project. Wow, Charlie, what a fantastic project. Uh, and certainly something that we're making so desperately. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the, you've got a hotel component uh, as a part of the project. Do you want to touch just a little bit on what the status is and where you're going with the hotel component? Sure. The The hotel we view is a really important uh, part of the what we're calling the whole campus, Mike. It's, it's, um, it's going to come uh, on the south end of the site. It's going to be between the apartments and, and, the, and the transit plaza. But uh, so right now, Construction loans are a little bit more difficult to get after this COVID-19 period, but we're we're still uh, planning to do the hotel, and we uh, the hotel will be integrated into the campus, and we're we're working through right now restarting our our hotel discussions, uh, so that but we want to get the apartment project getting going out of the ground, and we're an actual plan check on that right now at the city. So, but the hotel uh, will move forward. Wonderful. Uh, again, really, really exciting. Something that we have a great deal of need for in addition to housing is we don't have enough hotels as well. So uh, just Charlie, to, to wrap up, I want to touch base on construction costs and availability of labor that's plagued uh, the constructed industry yeah. for the past several years. Can you just briefly touch on that? Yeah, sure. I think the way to sort of capsulize that from our standpoint, at least at La Terra, and we're, we're, we're doing over 3,000 units right now all over Los Angeles area. 
Uh, I'll tell you this. I think that there is improvement in the short run, and that's because the construction starts have slowed way down. So that's freed up some of the labor and some of the material, so that has brought costs down. But I'm going to say that I think over the long run, it's going to be the availability of labor and materials will still be an issue for us going forward in the long run. But today, we look better than we have in quite some time. Wonderful. Charlie, thank you so much. That was, uh, you know, really a, a fantastic and informative uh, introduction to the project and certainly an exciting project. Thank you. Moving on now, we've got another exciting project to hear about. And uh, we have joining us Timur Tessimer, the uh, CEO of Overton Moore Properties. Uh, Timur, again, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for the fabulous development that you brought to Burbank. And um, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about Avion? Thank you, Michael. I'm sure everyone can hear me at this point. Um, yeah, we, uh, we acquired Avion Burbank, uh, the former Lockheed Skunk Works plant back in April of 2016. We're currently under construction. You can see the, see the pat project in the background here. I'll move my head there. Um, project is about 1.2 million square feet on 60 acres of land adjacent to the uh, future Hollywood Burbank Airport new terminal. Um, Mixed use project, like I mentioned, industrial, creative office, retail, and 150 key hotel. Um, the industrial portion of the project will be complete by the end of this year, and um, the office will be com office and retail will be complete by April of 2021, with the hotel uh, being complete sometime in 2022. Um, you drive out there today, you'll see, you know, over 300 people on the site. Um, so we've been very, very excited about the progress and, and how everything's going. You also have a, a hotel component um, with, with your project. Do you want to touch base on, on that a little bit as you're talking about the overall project as well? Sure. Uh, so we have a 150 key hotel and uh, we're negotiating a purchase contract uh, with a hotel operator um, as we speak right now, it'll be a select service hotel and we'll have a rooftop um, restaurant that are that will overlook the runway or you'll be able to see the runway lobby bar and, and meeting room. So we're really excited about the components of the hotel. And I can go over these slides in a little bit when we talk about the office. Wonderful. Um, Steve, Steve, so you talk, you talk a little bit about the office. You've got uh, a really, really significant office component here. Uh, you've got different types of offices. Why don't you tell us a little about uh, what we can expect uh, for that uh, part of the project? Yeah, so what we're doing here, and you know, Jeff, Jeff alluded about it, you have over six and a half million feet of office space in Burbank. Uh, it's mostly mid-rise and, and high-rise towers. And what we're really trying to do is create a unique environment where we really des designed this project and specifically the creative office to incorporate lifestyle and work environment. Um, you know, we, we think uh, in this current environment, we're gonna see movers migrating from downtown and from high rise office buildings into this office setting where, um, you know, users control their own access and exclusive entry and, and touchless uh, key access. Um, we have plenty of common areas, outdoor and indoor outdoor areas where people can meet. We've also incorporated operable windows. Um, and, and really, what, again, what we're trying to do is uh, really create this unique environment where we have over three and a half pa uh, per thousand free surface parking. And then we've got nine covered, multi nine covered outdoor meeting areas throughout the project. And the project will be also be create Wi-Fi. So we're just, again, really trying to create this nice open environment and if you can look at some of these pictures, you can see what you're looking at right now is the interior of the office project, uh, the previous one where we have uh, outdoor meeting areas. Uh, and then you can see the inside of the office buildings or rendering of the office building right here. We also have this multi-purpose uh, path that's gonna go uh, from the Burbank North Metrolink station throughout the whole project. And again, we'll have uh, meeting areas throughout that project. The, the other unique part of our project that it, it is really transportation centric with the Antelope Valley line right across the street from our project, the airport, terrific freeway access and Hollywood way. Um, it, it will be, a, you know, very easy for people to get to the project. 
One thing that we're doing unique about this project, we're offering buildings for lease or for sale. Yeah, as you know, most, most corporate users want to lease buildings, but entrepreneurs want to buy buildings. Entrepreneurs want to build a nest egg and, and they, they rather, you know, would rather pay a mortgage every month where they're building up this nest egg for their retirement versus paying rent. So that's another uh, value proposition that we're adding on the project. Wonderful, uh, Timur. Thank you so much for that. Timur, we've heard through the, the grapevine that you've got some fantastic new tenancies coming to Burbank. Uh, anything that you can share with us uh, on, on that front? Well, as you know, uh, we sign confidentiality agreements, so I can't disclose you know, who's coming to the project at this point. What I can tell you, though, we've had significant interest from entertainment companies, studios, life science firms, clean tech, e-commerce, and the cosmetics industry. And then on the office uh, side, pretty much the same. We've also seen professional service users, production companies, a lot of entrepreneurs, but also a lot of public companies who are really looking at this unique environment. Um, I can tell you, though, I believe when this project's complete, that it'll be 75 to 80 percent uh, pre-leased uh, by the first quarter of 2021. And, and something else, um, unlike some of our other projects, we are actively negotiating letters of intent right now. Uh, with multiple users. So even during this environment where uh, it's, you know, activity has slowed down, we've seen really good interest for the project. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, really, really exciting project. Uh, what you've done in terms of connecting with transportation is really where uh, development, uh, you know, is heading in the future and just so excited to have this project coming to Burbank. We're going to introduce Jill Ward, um, Vice President uh, of uh, at Providence uh, Health and Services. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the new ER that we're building will benefit every owner, occupier, and member of this community, which is why we established the Real Estate Committee. And uh, the Real Estate Committee provides a one-stop shop of all the expertise a broker or seller would need to determine if they can benefit more by using the real estate for a gift uh, than by an outright sale. And just as my family benefited from one of these vehicles, there are many others that can be tailored uh, to individual circumstances. And uh, Joe's gonna talk a little bit about that, but before uh, Joe, uh, we introduce Joe, I also wanna introduce- Hello. De Deborah King uh, is, leads the real estate committee from the staff perspective. And for anyone that's an owner of real estate uh, or a broker that wants to look at some of the amazing opportunities that we have, uh, Deborah at our local Burbank Foundation office would be the person to interface with as well. Uh, but now, uh, Joe, we've got our $78 million expansion and our emergency services project in Burbank that will be opening in phases over the next few years. Um, how is the donation of real estate emerged as a great vehicle for effective and strategic philanthropy. Thank you, Michael. And I want to thank you and your family for your tremendous show of support for our health in the Burbank community. Um, so for this audience in particular, I'm sure it doesn't come as any surprise that for most individuals in our community, the largest single asset will be their home. It'll be held in real estate. And it's certainly true just because we live in California. If you own something, it is extremely valuable. And for most, if not all individuals in our community, uh, St. Joseph's has touched them either personally or a loved one in a very personal way, either life-saving, life life-changing kind of way. So uh, with that in mind, it is no surprise that real estate is increasingly used as the funding asset for charitable gifts benefiting the medical center. And we have all, uh, a wide variety of these uh, arrangements that uh, I'd want to just sort of stress are these really can be beneficial for individuals and for the medical center. There's no situation where it's going to just benefit an individual and not the charity or just the charity and and not the individual. Um, but it depends on a lot of a lot of variables, which could include things like does this person want to live in the property until they pass? Are they looking to downsize? Are they going to be purchasing something after this and they're looking for an income stream? Uh, is it a summer home, a vacation home that we're talking about, a rental that they've had for a long time and they know that if they did sell that, the capital gains would be ridiculous and that's sort of putting a stop to the transaction. 
this is something where like if I can get the information out to a broker, these arrangements can actually be beneficial because you can put these properties into charitable trusts. They're, they're sold within the trust and they avoid all capital gains. They then, that those funds are invested and an income stream is created for the donor. So this is something where we get to actually be beneficial and help individuals who want to support the hospital, but also get out of a sticky situation. I think the 1031 exchange was brought up earlier too. Folks who have uh, been doing these for many years and then they decide, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. They are stuck with that original cost basis in most cases is very low. And then they've got a property that they own that is uh, a, highly appreciated. How do they get out of that? How do they get out of that cycle? That property is another uh, situation where you could put that into a charitable trust and avoid the capital gains that would be created based on that very low uh, cost basis. So lots of different scenarios and I'm not going to get into too many details here, but um, real estate can fund things like charitable gift annuities that create a fixed income stream, this charitable remainder trust or tax exempt trust, it can be called either. That tax exempt piece really has to do with the sale of the property within the trust. And I want to stress here too that if you bring something like that to the medical center, to Deborah, to the real estate committee, and you are a broker, you don't lose that business. We will work with you on the sale and those, those fees will still go to you even though this is a charitable gift. So you're not losing business by, by bringing these things up to your, to your clients. Um, but these can avoid, you know, avoiding capital gains, uh, creating income stream for life for a term of years, immediate charitable deductions. Um, real estate can be used for a, just a variety of arrangements. So uh, I think I will throw that out here and just say, you know, I'm not going to go into specifics again, but I want to stress and encourage anybody who has questions about this, you are going to receive a follow up email that will have an attachment to give a little more information. It will have my contact information and I would stress you know, reach out and let me do a, an actual calculation for you. Let me crunch some numbers and send them back to you based on the scenario that you're dealing with and let you see what those benefits might be for you and your uh, clients. Thanks, Joe. So a couple of things. The, the, yes. With all the changes in the tax laws in the last few years, this is one of the few really powerful uh, remaining opportunities that exist that hasn't been um, changed by, by recent tax legislation. And also, yes. this applies to all types of properties, whether it's residential, commercial, a home, a vacation home, vacant land. Uh, there's really the opportunity to utilize uh, this type of gifting strategy uh, across the entire uh, spectrum of, of real estate. Isn't that, isn't that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. We always throw farms in there too, Michael. So you can do this with your farm. <laughs> and farms and ranches as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, Joe, thanks so much for that. And um, a you know, great opportunity uh, for people to reach out to you and Deborah to, to see uh, how uh, some of these opportunities uh, may be available. Now we've got a, some time for some questions and we've had some great questions that have been coming in uh, throughout the webinar. And so I'm going to ask these to, uh, to some of our panelists. And so the first question is for Jeff. Jeff, um, the question is, what's the timing on the Second Century Project? When do you see that as being complete uh, and, and being occupied by Warner Brothers? So it's the, the, the 810,000 feet and two buildings, we've started construction on both uh, already. The first phase, which is 350,000 feet, they'll occupy July 22. And the second phase, which is the balance about 460, they'll occupy July of 23. Uh, the next question that we have is for Simone. Simone, uh, along with a general lack of housing in the city of Burbank, uh, there's also a lack of affordable housing. And uh, do we think that, that the lack of affordable housing is inhibiting businesses from wanting to locate in, in Burbank? And uh, what are we doing to encourage the development of more affordable housing? Uh, really, I don't think that the lack of affordable housing is inhibiting businesses. We're still seeing lots of businesses come in, lots of demand for uh, new businesses coming in, and lots of new jobs. I do think that we need to build more affordable housing, and we've been working on that uh, 
the big piece will be the density bonus projects um, and how we put those together. So we'll be taking those to council basically on a density bonus project is you are given extra um, units for providing in incentives to the community and helping us build out to our neighborhoods. So I think that that will help a lot. The other piece that is helping a lot are the ADUs, the accessory dwelling units that are being built right now. And so those really are smaller units. And so they're typically affordable if they're being rented on that property. So I think that uh, affordable is very important. And our goal is to incorporate that affordable within the housing units and the housing projects that are going forward and to get a good mix that supplies houses for everyone. Thank you, Simone. Um, and so again, while I've got you uh, on the line here, some of the other questions have um, also been about housing and about some of the recent housing uh, that um, has been uh, recently entitled. And uh, the question is, uh, can you comment on the amount of rezoning and the amount of entitlement that was necessary to uh, achieve the recent housing uh, that has been approved, number one. And then number two, can you comment on if we're going to need additional rezoning and additional changes to the housing elements to get to that 12,000 uh, housing unit number that you spoke about? Yeah, I think we are going to look at making some changes. Really right now, our planning department is going through four different specific plans. They're doing the Golden State specific plan, Magnolia Center uh, plan, the, um, the I'm, I'm sorry, I just missed the one. Um, we're also working on the gas um, plan. Hold on just a second, let me pull out my notes, sorry. Just one minute. The housing element update, the Golden State specific plan, the Mag Burbank Center Plan and the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan. Those are all plans that we're working on right now. And when we do those plans, the zoning and the requirements uh, for benefits in those areas and will be included within those plans. And we think that that's really gonna help because it's going to set the expectation going forward for what we want and what Burbank desires in building out these new neighborhoods and communities. And it'll help the developer because it'll really sense some, some expectations for both of us moving forward. I hope that helps. Wonderful, so Simone, one last question for you. We've gotten a lot of questions here coming out about the housing. housing. Sure. Um, what, what about the infrastructure that we have in the community and the infrastructure in terms of, of systems and schools and, and, and sewer and water capacity? And have we been looking at the infrastructure uh, that's gonna be necessary to support uh, 12,000 new homes? We actually have been looking at the infrastructure quite heavily. Uh, in terms of sewer, water, those types of things, we have more than enough capacity to, currently. We really have done a very good job on saving our water and reusing water within the city. Our water demand actually has gone down. It goes down, it seems, every year with our conservation efforts per unit. And so we have a lot of capability in that area. The same goes for our sewer. And then on our capacity for our um, other things, we collect development fees when we do new developments that will ultimately help. One of the things that we've actually done uh, with all of you, you all know it because you all went through it, is community benefits and the negotiation processes through your, your projects. And really that has done more, I think, for Burbank as far as infrastructure improvements have gone. You, it, I have to give hands off to you because all of you have done infrastructure improvements or are in the process of doing infrastructure improvements will really help our city in whole. In regards to the schools, 
the school has more than enough capacity if they stop letting people from outside of the area come into our schools. We have approximately a thousand people, a little bit over, I believe, that come into our schools that actually don't live in Burbank. Uh, if you're employed in Burbank and we have capacity within the schools, we're taking those students. So we do have capacity for our own students as we move forward. Okay, um, fascinating, fascinating stuff. We, you know, we're really at a at a crossroads in terms of housing here in the community. Um, since our our uh, people that are, are participating in the webinar are mostly real estate professionals and and fairly technically aligned, uh, I've got a question about uh, office demand that I guess I'll throw it to Jeff first, and and then maybe ask Timur if he wants to comment. Are we seeing uh, a different demand for office space? For the open floor plans, uh, larger floor plates, and uh, you know a different configuration than sort of the office buildings that you were building ten years ago, Jeff. Yeah, I think you know up until the beginning of this year, I think the the idea was a more open plan, um, densification, and kind of a common area package that were shared. I think we're probably going to retreat from that a little bit based on what's occurred in the last you know, four or five months in this country, what we're seeing in just in my own office, we started pulling people apart and moving desks apart and creating a bigger separation. So I know there's a lot of talk about the work from home um, future. This is a good example why this, this being done in person would have been a lot easier. Um, so I do believe once we're, it's safe for everyone to get back together again uh, and work together and collaborate together, there's going to be, uh, that's going to be the direction we're going to proceed. But I think we're going to have more square feet per person in the future than the direction we were going over the last 10 years or so. Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I see as well. Um, uh, Timur, do you want to jump in and talk about, you know, how you're perceiving the demand in terms of the type of product uh, that, that you're designing your projects to meet uh, here, in, here in Burbank? Yeah, I, I don't think I could be designing better product for our environment right now because we, we don't have large common areas. We don't have parking structures. We don't have valet. We have surface parking. Uh, we're going to be adding uh, UV light bars to HVAC, try to go touchless technology wherever we can. But again, you know, also having indoor outdoor patios that connect to the office space, operable windows. You, know, you could do these on two, two story jewel boxes, but it's a lot tougher to do it on a high rise building. So we're, we're actually seeing pretty good demand. Uh, and I think it's because we're offering buildings for lease and for sale and these amenities in the project, but clearly things uh, will change. And I think the question though is, you know, will we go back to where we were six months ago, two years from now? And that, that I think is a jump ball. Thanks, Timur. Uh, really interesting how uh, the design that, that you're bringing forward with your project, a project that was designed last year, uh, is going to meet the market demand that we're seeing uh, this year. So um, that's, that's, that's really encouraging. Uh, you know, I know, Timur, that you've got some... Uh, confidentiality agreements, but we're getting lots and lots of questions from participants uh, wanting to know about Amazon. Is there anything that you can publicly say about Amazon at this point? Uh, other than I probably receive one or two Amazon packages to my house every day. That's really all I can say at this point. Uh, Timur, we, we appreciate that. And um, I think that I probably receive more than one or two a day. <laughs> uh, it's really become a way of life, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Simone, I want to go back to you. There's also been a number of questions um, about the uh, the IKEA site and 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 the mall, and a lot of people interested about uh, what's going on in downtown Burbank with the mall, the IKEA sites. There's been some development plans that have been discussed there. Uh, what can you share with us uh, now about what what the city's perception of, of what's occurring there or what will occur there in the near future? I can't share a lot. <laughs> I, I can tell you that plans are constantly changing with uh, both the mall and the Ayala Kia site. We are talking to the developers. Uh, we had a meeting last week. We will continue to talk to them, but as far as anything solidified right now, 
I don't have an answer for that. Okay, so thanks for that, Simona. And again, there's a, a lot of things changing uh, in, in today's market, which is gonna bring me back to Charlie. Uh, Charlie, one of the questions from one of our participants was, uh, how do you see demand changing uh, for your project as a result of, of uh, what's happened now with this COVID pan pandem pandemic? Uh, you know, what impact do you see that having uh, on the, your project and, and, and market demand for that? Yeah, Mike, I think there has been, uh, there are changes and a couple of, it, some of it is in demand. And I think the demand side means that people are working from home more. And, and I think that's something that really drives the residential and the particularly the apartment business, um, which is good for us. It also drives, because as I know I've been hearing some design questions come in on what about office design is changing. And I think uh, the same is true for the residential and the apartment design. So we're also ch making those changes. We're opening up floor plans. We're adding uh, individual open spaces like more and larger balconies. We're also cr creating more and larger common open spaces. So these are things that, you know, like outdoor gym spaces rather than more indoor gym spaces. So we're combining those. And I think uh, these are all changes that are a result of this COVID-19 thing. And I think that we're, um, we're gonna see that going forward becoming more permanent than temporary. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, Charlie. So last question before we wrap up. Uh, Charlie, are, are you anticipating in, in projects like the one that you're breaking around on now, uh, there being more of a work from home element? And do we in the real estate development business need to think about you know, accommodating the work from home client that mm -hmm. maybe didn't exist three months ago? 100%, Mike. And I think you being in that business as well probably know that that is the case. And, and that what that does is it drives a couple of more design changes, including um, places for better package delivery, cold storage for delivery before residents can pick it up, maybe even sometime in the future drone delivery services. And so uh, the, the work from home thing better, I mean, you have to have impeccable internet and Wi-Fi coverage in your building and cell coverage. These are things that are a must for our business today. Wonderful, Charlie. Uh, thank you for those uh, thoughts and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, thank you to the participants who have joined us here today. And thank you to our sponsors, Avis and Young, CBRE, and the Howard Realty Group. Um, this has been a, a you know, fantastic opportunity to get just some amazing input from the leaders in, in the local real estate industry. Uh, I hope that all of our participants enjoyed this. Uh, we will, you will be getting outreach uh, from the Providence team uh, to look at case studies and other opportunities to um, look at how you can execute philanthropy and do it in a way that's very beneficial in terms of long-term uh, economic and estate planning. So again, thanks to everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.